not, we're thankful to be here today, thankful to be able to come and to worship the Lord uh, in spirit and in truth. We thank uh, God for his goodness. A new year, happy new year to all of you. Uh, some were gone uh, after the Christmas uh, holiday and they get to see you, or some were gone for a Christmas holiday and they get to see you. Glad you're back and uh, thankful to be able to come and just to, to gather again. We've got some that are traveling. Uh, I know we're still recovering to uh, west, western areas of uh, this great state of Tennessee are recovering from storm damage and such, and we had a lot of rain, wind yesterday, and um, I woke up this morning, and my phone told me that I'm under a winter storm warning in my neighborhood, so I said 70 degrees yesterday, might have two inches of snow tonight, we'll see if it happens, we'll see, right? So, we're glad you're here, though. Let's dig into the Word of God for a few moments this morning. Uh, if you got your Bibles, turn to Luke 2. Uh, we've got one more, uh, I guess you would say, a Christmas message on our heart that God's put there, and uh, we want to share that with you today as we uh, start this new year off uh, digging into God's Word as we've done for the years we've been here. Uh, Luke 2, uh, verse number 25. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me there and please stand and honor the Word of God. We're going to read part of this uh, in your hearing this morning. Uh, Luke 2, verse 25. Uh, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, Simeon, if everyone pronounce it. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the rise, or fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, she was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up again to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We praise your holy name. We ask you to bless your word today. May you put your words in our mouth and give your words to your people. We submit ourselves to you, Father, uh, as just a vessel that we want you to use. We submit ourselves to the church to you today, Father, that you would use us as well in this community to be a bright light uh, to those around us. May you bless each family, each individual who's here today, Father. And if there's anybody here that's lost, may you speak to them and draw them to salvation. And God, we give you the praise and the glory in Christ's name. And amen. As we close out uh, last year and I guess if you want to call it uh, sermon series or whatever uh, on our Christmas sermons and such we come to this passage and it's very fitting that if you go back up to look in verse 21 of Luke that when the eight days were completed for his circumcision he was named Jesus it's been eight days since Christmas and if you can Imagine in your mind Christ being born there on Christmas Day and then eight days later being circumcised and getting his, getting his name. Uh, of course, that was the name that was told to Joseph and Mary to name him was Jesus. Now we fast forward. It's been 40 days since Christ's birth. Under the law in Leviticus 12, it tells us that when a, uh, a woman gave birth to a son, she was... Uh, ceremonially unclean for 40 days. So after this 40-day period was up, she was able to, uh, to, to come back out into the assembly. And there they just so happened, uh, they were in Bethlehem and very close to the temple. 
They didn't have to go just a, to some synagogue. They actually went to the temple of God uh, to present uh, Jesus there. And we know that when he was presented, normally you gave a lamb, a male lamb. Uh, if you didn't have a lot of money, you were able to give a pair of two uh, turtle doves or two young pigeons. So then Joseph and Mary were not wealthy. Plus they were, again, uh, not strangers in a strange land, but they were, this was not their hometown. They were from Nazareth. So 40 days have passed, and there they go into the temple, in the temple complex area, uh, to present him to the Lord. Here we meet a man named Simeon. Now it's very interesting to look at this man. It says The scripture says that the Holy Spirit was on him. When I read that, I'm reminded of how the Holy Spirit came upon Samson and gave Samson great strength and might. I'm reminded of how this Holy Spirit, in essence, came upon Moses as well. Kind of the same attitude, same uh, formality in that way. And how he was able to work all kinds of miracles with the power of God. I'm reminded of the time that the Holy Spirit fell upon Saul. After he was anointed by Samuel and Saul prophesied about God. Then we see the Holy Spirit come up on David. As David, we know the Holy Spirit was on David when he stood against Goliath. Because David said, I don't come to you in my power and my strength. I come to you in the name of the Lord. There, David, the Holy Spirit was upon him. We see the Holy Spirit moving in all sorts of places in the Old Testament. And we see the Holy Spirit evident here as he came upon Simeon. The Bible says. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Now, think about that just for a moment. I've never had this occurrence of the Holy Spirit tell me that, Paul, you're not going to die until you do this or see this. And I dare say none of us have either. But Simeon did. The Holy Spirit of God told him, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. Now, we know the Messiah had been looked for for hundreds and thousands of years at this point in time. They were, this was a dark time, and it had been a dark time in Israel. And they were looking for the Messiah. And now Simeon is told by the Holy Spirit of God, you're not going to die until you see him. There's a lot at play here, a lot at work here. This is not some chance meeting that it was eight days after Christ's uh, birth that he was circumcised. It wasn't a chance meeting. It was 40 days uh, that Simeon, that Jesus was brought there, that Simeon just so happened to be there. This was God-ordained. I believe this, this ordaining moment for Simeon was just as important for him as it was. I mentioned Sunday school. I hate, to, I hate to repeat myself. It was just as important for Simeon, this event here, as it was for the woman, the Samaritan with the well in John chapter 4. That was a God-ordained moment. I want to remind you that when you, if you've been saved by the grace of God, when you met him, that was a God-ordained moment that God spoke to you, revealed himself to you, and drew you to salvation. It was ordained in that moment by the mighty power of God. We see him. Simeon, it says in verse 27, he was guided by the Spirit. He entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God. Now, when I, we get here on Sunday mornings, when I uh, da and sometimes dash, I weave my way uh, through those on the sidewalk, and I love to do that too. Uh, eventually, when we get these buildings connected, I'll weave my way through that little, that little area too uh, to get in here. I, I like to be in here, of course, to set a few things up, uh, but I like to try my best to greet everybody who comes in. I don't get to always do that. For those who I may have missed this morning, good morning, happy new year. But I try to do that because I want to see people come into God's house. Now, when you leave here, uh, there's, there's multiple ways out, but most of y'all go out one door. You have to all say bye to me at least. So you have to at least say good riddance, dude, whatever. So, but we, we try to, to welcome people into God's house because God wants us to be welcome in his home. 
the Holy Spirit had led Simeon here to, in essence, where God's Shekinah glory had dwelt in the past. Uh, by my understanding, by my study of the Word of God, I do not believe that the Shekinah glory cloud of God was on this temple. It was not there in the holy of holy places as it once was. It had, dis- he had departed and had never come back yet. But there, there was something greater. There was Jesus in his father's house at, eight, at 40 days old. 40 days old, there he is. And Simeon sees him, guided by the Spirit of God. I don't think that Jesus is as a baby. I don't think he had a halo over his head. I don't think he's shown with all kinds of amazing glory cloud like Moses did after being on the mountain there. Uh, he looked like a baby. But guided by the Spirit, Simeon knew who he was. It was revealed to him who he was. And Simeon took him up in his arms and We look at our first point today, my eyes have seen your salvation. Look what he says. Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. As the Lord promised Simeon, so God kept his promise. He saw the Lord's Messiah. Simeon got to hold him in his arms. Now, I don't know what took place here. I don't know, uh, did Mary reluctantly give him up? She knew who he was. Joseph knew who he was. But somehow she allows Simeon to take him up in his arms. And I don't know if he took him up and held him like this or, or held him like, I don't know. But he prays God and says, Master, you can dismiss your servant now in peace as you promised. So I ask you a question. You, you dwell on this for a while. I have really no answer uh, other than to, to say Yes. Was Simeon speaking to the Father or was he speaking to the Messiah who was holding in his hands? Think about that for a moment. How how amazing that is. As you promised. You can dismiss me, Lord, I'm ready to go. He guided Simeon to this point. God kept his promise. And Simeon, my eyes have seen your salvation. For Simeon, this was his... I don't want to call this a, a, a salvation experience like we go through as believers today. This was, this was far, I don't call it far different, but it was different. Because we believe Simeon was already a follower of Christ in the sense of looking for him to come. This is just the fruit of his salvation being evidently, being evident that day. As he took him up in his arms and praised God, my eyes have seen your salvation. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to depart now in peace. No more looking, no more longing, no more wondering when the Messiah is going to come. No wondering how long am I going to have to wait and suffer in this life until he comes. Simeon saw him and he was ready to go home. Ready to go home. The same is true of believers today. We have seen God's salvation. If we've been saved, we have seen it. It's occurred to us. It's an experience we can sometimes not put into words what happened to us. I've shared this date numerous times. I was saved in 1981. I, I, I can't put it all into words what happened. I remember leaving the pew that I was sitting in and, and going out to the right side of that pew and, and to the wall there, which had an opening in it, and I don't remember anything else. I don't remember what I prayed. I don't remember what the message was that day. I remember my, my being hugged several times. I remember my, one thing that's clear to me still today is my aunt, who's in heaven today, hugged me so hard she picked me up off the floor. I, I'd probably never been hugged that hard before, but I had been that, I was that night anyway. So. But I remember that clearly. But I don't remember anything else that happened. It just happened. Something changed in me. I knew that I was lost. I knew that something that was so important that I needed, I was missing. And what was missing was Jesus. And I saw salvation that night. No, I've not seen Jesus with my natural eyes, but someday I'm going to. Someday I'm going to. But right now he lives inside of me. I have seen his salvation. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. It's occurred to me. 
I've experienced it, and I experience it anew every day. When I open up God's Word and, and I read it and God speaks to me, I'm reminded that I have seen His salvation. For us, the Holy Spirit guided Simeon, so the Holy Spirit will guide us who believe in Him as well. Secondly, we look at, in verse 31, it says, You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Revelation and glory for all people. Now, the Messiah, of course, we, we, if, you, if, you, if you look at the scripture, the Messiah was to come through uh, the Jewish people there, uh, specifically through the tribe of Judah, uh, and even more specifically from the, 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 the line of David, which he did. God protected that line. If you go back and look at David's history and David's descendants' history, there were times in the Old Testament where Satan tried to snuff that line completely out. But God protected it and kept it, kept it going all the way up through both Joseph and Mary, we understand. How, I don't know, but he did. There Jesus came into physical form by the Holy Spirit, placed in Mary's womb, and then born nine months later. Forty days after that, we see him here in the temple. And Simeon's praise, you have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. He has and he is, Jesus, revealing himself to all people. I do not believe there will be anyone who will stand before God and honestly be able to say, I never heard about you. I never knew you existed, God. I believe God magnifies himself, reveals himself in ways that we cannot comprehend. And all of that revealing and all that understanding is to lead us to Jesus. Not to worship the sun, not to worship the stars, the moon, or the things that God's created, but to worship the creator. And we as believers know that without Christ, there was nothing made that was made. The Holy Spirit his mission, his purpose is to draw people to the Savior, Jesus. The church's mission, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, is to lead people to reveal to them Jesus Christ. And it is not our responsibility to save them. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. Our job is to tell people the truth of God's Word. Then the Holy Spirit reveals that truth to them. But he is for all people. The Messiah is for all people. All people. Now, this, this tidbit here at the end of the verse 32, it says, a glory and glory to your people Israel. We can never get away. We can never take out, replace. I, I've, I've shared this term with you before. And you may have heard it as well if, you, if you're new here. Replacement theology. The church has not replaced the Jewish people as being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have not replaced them. No, we haven't. We've been adopted into that family. We've been brought in. We've been grafted in, according to the Scripture. Grafted in as wild olive trees. We've been grafted into the real olive tree, which we know is the root, is Jesus and his salvation experience. The Jewish people today uh, do not earn salvation through the law. Uh, they have to earn or get. They can't earn it. We can't earn it either. They gain or receive salvation only by the grace of God now as we, as we do. But the glory for Israel, I believe, is that Jesus was a descendant of David, came to bring and restore Israel back to God, but also to bring the Gentiles into that as well. But I believe the glory for Israel is that Jesus will reign as king of kings in the new Jerusalem. That's, that's the way I look at it. There may be a whole lot more to it than that, but just to get down in this to the simplest way to put it, that's going to be their glory throughout all of eternity. All of eternity, Jesus will reign as king of kings and lord of lords in the new Jerusalem. And out of the, from under the throne, there flows a river. And where that river goes, it changes life, it changes things. 
It gives life. On both sides of the river grows a tree of life. How is that possible? I do not know. I just know what the scripture says. And I'm going to see that someday. Because Jesus has been revealed to me and I've received the glory of Christ in my life and someday I'm going to see him in his glory and power. I'm going to see that, witness that. Then, my, then I will truly and fully and completely see the salvation of the glory of God in my life. The gospel is for everyone. There's no one you'll encounter. You'll, you, let me back up. There is no one that you will encounter that deserves salvation. I don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve salvation. But God is gracious and merciful and loves us so much that he gives it to us who don't deserve it. But you will also never encounter someone you will never meet someone and I know there's some there's some bad mean people out there but you will never encounter someone that God cannot save that God cannot change in their lives if he so chooses and he might just use you to witness to them for him to use that witness to change that person's life we don't we don't know God could be sending us to somebody we, we have given up hope on being saved. And suddenly, it might be you or God might send somebody else to them and something just clicks in how they say it to, or what they say or how they live. Or God sends an event upon their life to draw them to salvation. But nobody, nobody deserves salvation. But man, I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm thankful that he revealed himself to me who did not deserve it. But I'm thankful for it. And wouldn't trade it for anything. Wouldn't give it up for nothing. But I'll also never meet anybody that I'm too good not to witness to. Nah, you, you done stepped in it now, Paul. Or stepped on it. Right? Too often, we pick and choose who we want to witness to. We're afraid, what if they do believe? What if they come to my church? Our church might change. Maybe our church might need to change in some ways. We don't like change, Paul. I'm not much of a change goer either. Though I do change my socks every day. I change other things every day too. Don't shave every day, but you like me better when I do, right? We change things all the time. Why are we afraid of change? We've changed a lot of things. We've changed buildings in the last year or so, haven't we? What God has done for us. How God has done things for us. We've asked, we've prayed for God to bring new people into our church. And he's done that and doing that. We've lost people to death. They've gone on to glory without us. How else are we going to have God... Yes, God's brought us plenty of children, still bringing children. And we praise God for every one of those children, right? But I don't want to wait another generation for the next group of people to come to this church, right? Look around us. I, I shared this at maybe, I know I shared it on Christmas Day with some of our family, and then I shared it maybe Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve uh, with people over the church that, just not too very far from us, about a three, three, three and a half hour drive from here is the city of Nashville. Nashville is growing by leaps and bounds. If you want to buy a house in Nashville, you better be ready to pay a lot of money for it, a lot of money for it, if you can find one. There are people moving to Nashville from California, from other parts of the world. You know what they're trying to get away from? They're trying to get away from high taxes, away from other things, and sometimes, yes, away from the crazy aspects of living in some states. They're coming here. But just about 20 minutes down the road is the city of Knoxville. It's growing, too. I've witnessed Knoxville growing in my lifetime. And there's people moving into our county, too. Who's the gospel for? It's for them. It's for them. 
is for them. Yes, it is for those who are still being born, who are people from Granger County and Knox County, lived there all their lives. It's for their kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and so on and so on. It's for them too. But it's also for those we might think don't look like us or don't talk like us. Or if we met them up north, they'd be rude. Unlike us who are as polite as can be, right? Right? The gospel is for them. The same gospel that changed my life is the same gospel that changed the apostles Paul's life in the book of Acts. The same gospel. The very same one. He still changes lives today when he reveals himself to somebody. And he uses the church led and guided by the Holy Spirit just like he did Simeon here to reach those who were lost. Revelation and glory for all people. Then lastly, Simeon says this, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told them, told his mother Mary, indeed this child is destined to cause the rise and fall the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The fall and rise of many. Jesus causes a spiritual division in society. He does. Jesus' first advent was not to unite all people under one name. It was not. It was to divide people. He talked about it, dividing families. And in the last days, we would be divided, and we are now, over many topics. But spiritually, we are divided from those that are lost. As believers, we're divided from them in the sense that we're going one direction, and they're going another way. But we should not desire to hurry and get to where we're going and fail to witness to those who are going the opposite way. It is our responsibility, it is our desire, it should be our joy to share our faith with a lost and dying world, whether they accept it or not. It should be our joy to say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you why I'm so happy. Let me tell you why I am the way that I am. Let me tell you why that when things are just falling apart around us, I can have a smile on my face and joy in my heart. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He causes a spiritual division in society. And let me tell you this, we are either followers of Jesus or we oppose him. That's harsh, but it's the truth. We either are following Christ or we are in opposition to him. What do you mean? Everyone who is an unbeliever that has not followed Jesus Christ as their Savior opposes him because they are living in the world. They are living in the joys of the world and they are never satisfied. You never will be satisfied. At one point in time in my life, I was an enemy of God. I was. Until God says, I want to make peace with you. I don't want you to be my enemy anymore. And I agreed. And I accepted his offer of peace. I accepted his gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, when I sin, yes, I do things that, that, that when I commit sin, yes, I do things that blaspheme God's name, that take God's name in vain, that are in opposition to him. But I'm not his enemy. I'm his child now. You see the difference? When I sin, he, as a loving father, will correct his wayward child. Yes, and I deserve it. When you sin, when you sin, you deserve correction, amen? You deserve it. You need it. We need correction in our lives. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit when we sin and fall so that God the Father, the loving Father, can draw us back. But we are either followers of Christ or we oppose Him. Those who oppose Jesus and never accept His gift of salvation one day face eternal judgment. And we don't want that for anybody. We don't want anybody to face eternal judgment. We want people to be saved. We want people to have eternal life in Christ. That's why we preach his word. That's why we sing his praises. That's why we testify about who he is. Those who believe in Jesus 
we will rise into eternal life someday in glory. The fall and rise of many in Israel. Let's look at Christ's life here on this earth. While well, he was here, yeah, he caused the fall and rise of many. Many people believed in him. Many others did not. Many of those who did not never believed in him and died in their sins and went to hell. Those who did, those who did believe in him, though, they're with him today in heaven. What an amazing promise, amazing gift that God gave to them when they believed in his son. To Mary, he says, and the sword of pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary witnessed her son grow up. She witnessed him begin this earthly ministry, teaching and preaching and doing these miracles and going off of these 12 men and turning the world upside down. She witnessed this. One of Luke's main people forgetting his evidence on what to write was, his, was Jesus' mother Mary. She witnessed this. She witnessed her son die on the cross. She witnessed his resurrection as well. And where is Mary now? She's not just with her son. She's with her Lord. Because Jesus was not just her son. She was her heavenly father, savior, king of kings, and lord of lords. We meet Anna at the end of this as I come to a close. Anna tucked away, and you can debate about was she a widow for 84 years. Some translations read it differently. It doesn't matter. She was reaching, nearing 100 years old. She was an old lady in that day and time. But there she was in the temple, and she didn't leave it, the complex. She stayed there. If you go back and look at historical records, there were places for people like this to stay around the temple. She served in it in some fashion or form outside in the areas where the women could go, and she praised God. She came up at the same moment that Simeon was praising God and holding Jesus up high or whatever how he was doing it. And she came in and she agreed with what Simeon was doing. That tells me that God is for all people. No matter our age, no matter our ethnicity, the color of our skin, where we've been from, where we've been to, where, we're going, where we've been from, where we come from, or whatever. It doesn't matter what we've done, how bad we've been. Jesus is for all of us. He's for everyone in your family. He's for everyone in your workplace. But he came, he came to bring division, the fall and rise of many. He's dividing people today. He's dividing those as we look at one of the, the parables he shared was the parables of the tares the tear and the wheats. A man went out and sowed good seed in his field. His enemy came during the night and sowed bad seed, weeds. When they sprung up, came up, they both grew together. And his servants told the Lord, uh, the master, didn't you sow good seed? Yes, I sowed good seed. An enemy has sowed bad seed. The, 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 the servant said, well, do you want us to go tear the, the bad stuff out? No. He said, if you tear it out, you'll pull up all the other two. Let them both grow together. But in harvest time, there's when we will separate them. We'll gather the wheat into my barn, and the rest will throw into the fire. Someday, we've gotten divisions now. It will pale in comparison when Jesus Christ comes in power and great glory and divides those, divides those who believe in him from those who oppose him. We don't want those who oppose him to face that judgment. Now. We want them to be saved. If you're lost today, now, now is the day of salvation. Now is the right time. Not because it's a brand new year, because you've heard the gospel today. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know you might be. Don't be terrified. I know you might be. I remember, I remember being kind of scared, not necessarily worried, but just that but something got a hold of me. <laughs> he got a hold of me, and I'm glad he did. 
If he's trying to get a hold of you today, let him. You won't ever regret it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise your holy name. And we give you the honor and glory and thanksgiving. Bless your word. May you take it out and use it according to your will. We pray. If anybody here is lost, may you speak to them. Those who may watch later, may you speak to them. God, and draw them to salvation. God, just use your word to accomplish your amazing power. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Christ's name we pray. And amen. Let's stand and sing.